The Kraken, to some a relic of sailor stories, to others a cautionary tale of how myth can evolve from misunderstood reality. But the truth behind the Kraken is far more compelling than fantasy ever was. Its legend begins in the icy waters between Norway, Iceland, and Greenland. Long before maps circled monsters in uncharted corners, medieval Scandinavians were recording encounters with something vast and unexplainable. As early as 1180, King Sverre of Norway described sea beasts so enormous, they resembled floating islands. These weren't passing comments. They were integrated into texts like Konung Skugsja, The King's Mirror, a 13th century educational manual. Here, the Kraken wasn't just folklore, it was instruction. Seafarers were warned of its shipwrecking strength, its round body full of arms, and its ability to stir the sea itself. Even earlier, in Icelandic sagas, two sea monsters dominate, Hafgufa, the sea mist, and Lingbakr, the heatherback. Sailors mistook them for land masses, until those islands shifted, swirled, and dragged vessels into the deep. The very name Kraken has roots that reflect its grotesque character. In Old Norse, Kraki meant something twisted, a crooked object or malformed being. In Norwegian, Krake could mean a sickly, tangled creature. The terminology evolved across the North Atlantic, likening this entity to hooks, anchors, or the clawed limbs of a crab. Language itself bent to try and describe what the eye could not. But were they just imagining things? In Norway, long before modern science, beachcombers stumbled upon strange remains. Vast, rubbery flesh. Half-decayed arms with suckers like discs. Beaks encased in cartilage. Without knowledge of deep sea biology, locals saw omens, naming these carcasses sea monks, sea devils, or angels of the deep. They believed these were messages from divine or demonic forces. And it wasn't just peasants or poets. The Bishop of Bergen, Eric Pontapadan, included detailed kraken descriptions in his Natural History of Norway, 1752, based on widespread testimony from fishermen. According to Pontopidan, the kraken was flat and circular, full of arms or branches, and capable of lifting the sea itself. Sailors claimed that if their nets pulled in too many fish, it wasn't luck. It was a sign to flee. The kraken was beneath them, forcing prey upward as bait. He even documented an unsettling detail repeated by seafarers, that the creature would evacuate, foul-smelling waste that colored the sea, drawing fish to feed before devouring them all. This hunting technique, disturbing yet oddly calculated, mirrors certain cephalopods today that use ink to startle prey or bait fish with movement and scent. Pontopidan's accounts, though dramatic, were taken seriously. This was an era where science was beginning to catalog the world, and the kraken blurred the boundary between folklore and zoology. It wasn't the only such report. In 1734, Hans Egede, a missionary off Greenland, recorded seeing a beast with fins like broad paws, a rough body, and a tail that rose the length of a ship. It blew water like a whale, but didn't behave like one. Egede's description fused multiple marine traits. The finned body of a whale, the elongation of a serpent, the behavior of something unclassified. As sightings accumulated, artists and scientists alike began connecting dots. The French naturalist Pierre Denis de Montfort famously illustrated a colossal octopus dragging a ship into the sea. While he later overreached, falsely linking the kraken to the disappearance of a French warship, his engravings immortalized the image, a giant, multi-limbed predator pulling wooden vessels apart. But the biggest breakthrough came not from sketches or stories, but flesh and bone. In 1853, a squid carcass washed ashore in Denmark. Its beak was preserved by naturalist Japetus Steenstrup, who formally named a new genus, Architeuthis, the giant squid. For the first time, a creature once considered myth had a place in taxonomy. Then, in the 1860s and 1870s, Newfoundland became the epicenter of deep sea discovery. Giant squids stranded along the coast, tentacles as long as rooms, eyes as big as plates. Reverend Moses Harvey famously laid a 10-meter squid across his bathtub and photographed it, the first kraken-like creature ever caught on camera. Scientists began to connect the dots. Architeuthis ducks wasn't just real, it was the very creature behind centuries of monstrous accounts. Though not a ship destroyer, it fit the anatomical bill. A deep-sea cephalopod with eight arms, two elongated tentacles with serrated suckers, and a sharp beak hidden within. Its eyes, up to 30 centimeters across, are among the largest in the animal kingdom. Its body, soft and boneless, could mimic the shape of the seafloor. Its suckers left round scars on sperm whales, proof of deep ocean combat. And yet, 
They remained elusive. Not until 2004 did a team of Japanese researchers capture the first photographs of a live giant squid hundreds of meters below the surface. In 2012, a team using bioluminescent lures recorded video of one emerging from the dark, a graceful, silent predator, not the raging leviathan of lore. But if Architeuthis was the kraken, it wasn't the only contender. In Antarctic waters, an even heavier cousin lurked, Masonicotuthis hamiltoni, the colossal squid. First hinted at in 1925 from whale stomach contents, the full adult was not captured until 2007. The specimen weighed nearly half a ton, its tentacles bore swiveling hooks, and its body mass far exceeded the giant squids. But it was no killer. Its metabolic rate is astoundingly low. Some estimates suggest it moves only when absolutely necessary. Biologists suggest these animals are ambush predators. They don't charge ships. They float, wait, and snatch. They belong in the abyss, not near the surface. When one is seen above, it is likely dying. So why did sailors describe whirlpools, battles, shipwrecks? The answer lies in a phrase. The mind fills in the rest. The ocean is vast, unpredictable. Storms, rogue waves, sudden currents, all could be misunderstood as a creature's doing. Tentacles mistaken for seaweed, whale squid fights glimpsed at twilight. Maps once showed dragons and serpents, not because they existed, but because knowledge ended there. Even Carl Linnaeus, father of taxonomy, once considered listing a sea monster in his early catalogs before removing it from later editions. Montfort believed, Pontopidon believed. At one point, so did science. Today we know of about eight Architeuthis species. We know their anatomy, their predators, their range, but we still don't know how they reproduce, or how long they live, or how often they meet humans. The truth is, for all our progress, these creatures are still wrapped in mystery. And that is what makes the Kraken legend so enduring. It isn't just about whether a tentacled monster dragged a ship into the sea. It's about what we do when we see something we don't understand. Do we fear it? Do we imagine it? Do we chase it? The Kraken, it turns out, was never just a monster. It was our mirror, showing how stories grow from confusion, how fear shapes memory, and how legends evolve into evidence. And while we may never find a squid large enough to capsize a ship, the deep still holds secrets. The ocean the ocean remains one of the last unexplored frontiers, and just as the Kraken once terrified sailors, today it dares scientists to look deeper. Because in the end, the greatest legends are born not from what we see, but from what we almost see and never forget.